hello everyone who's made it. Thank you for being here. We're on a, our third webinar. We're going to be talking about how best to use social media as a scientist and issues that might come up. We have Emily Copeland here with us. She's from the Science Communication Network. So she's going to kind of give us a big picture overview of social media use. And then we're going to have a lot of time for questions. So please type those questions into the chat and Mary Anthea and I will mediate some questions at the end here. So with that, I will let you take it away, Emily. Thank you for being here. Great, thank you for having me, Jill. Um, yeah, I'm honored to be here. Um, so let me share my screen. So yeah, so I would wager that uh, for the people who are on and then of course for the recording, there are people who have a range of experience with social media so far um, professionally as a scientist. So while today I'll cover mostly sort of top line basics, um, I'll also touch on some, some practical tips that I hope you'll find useful even if you're more advanced um, when it comes to social media. And as Joan said, um, we'll wait for questions at the end. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so there are a myriad social media platforms out there, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Instagram. Uh, and I anticipate that, that many of the ones you see here you're familiar with, um, but more likely in your personal capacity versus your professional capacity. Um, but when it comes down to it, some of these platforms are, are just simply better for others than others uh, for use professionally, especially as a scientist. Um, and Twitter is what we're going to focus on today because it really does accomplish, I think, um, what, what scientists are looking for when it comes to using your time efficiently, um, reaching the audiences that you'd like to reach, uh, and reaping the rewards of online science communication and, and networking uh, that, that most people are looking for. So uh, why should you care about social media as a scientist? Um, as, you, as you probably already know, uh, social media can be an important tool for scientific discourse. Uh, writer Andrew Tarantola in, wrote an article last year in 2019 uh, in, in Gadget on how social media is revolutionizing the way scientists interact with the public. Um, and he called researchers the new influencer. Um, so in your own life, if you think about five to 10 years ago, um, think about how you first used to come across new epi studies or just uh, scientific studies in general, and then think about how, how you learn about new ones now. Um, more often than not, now you're learning about new science um, through your online networks. Uh, so you can see why, why it's important that you think about how to engage uh, through social media as a scientist. So according to Hootsuite and, and We Are Social, there are about 3.8 billion social media users globally um, in 2020, in the beginning of 2020, um, which is more people than there were on the entire planet in 1971. Uh, and in 2020, 3.8 billion is, is nearly half the world's population. So that's a lot of people. Uh, and it also presents an enormous opportunity to engage uh, a range of audiences who are on social media about your research findings um, and about your science that you might not be able to engage with normally. So let's get started. Um, today in this presentation, I'll go over three main, main topics. Uh, first, briefly the, the pros and cons of being a scientist online. Uh, second, we'll, we'll talk a bit about how to build your brand and your presence on social media. Um, again, using Twitter mostly as this is the case study. Um, and when I say brand, I, I know brand often, brand gets a bad rap, uh, but I don't mean a sales pitch. What I really mean is just your professional presence. Um, it's, it's what people think of when they think about you um, as a professional scientist. And then third, I'll talk a little bit about tips and strategies about how to protect your credibility online um, as a scientist, which I know is, is 
very important to most of you in this day and age. Okay, so being a scientist online, of course, brings certain pros. Um, you can get the latest news. Um, you can identify journalists who might cover your science once it's published. Um, you can learn about de recent developments in the field, including conferences uh, that pertain to your field of research. Um, you can learn about papers that others, your colleagues, have published. Uh, you can get help, advice, um, especially in areas uh, and issues facing those in academia. Um, you can also find out about jobs um, or learn about calls for paper submissions. You can also grow your professional network uh, beyond those in you, with whom you immediately work with. Um, so others in your discipline, say at other universities. Uh, you can also network with other disciplines um, beyond epidemiology, say. So within the field of environmental health, um, other researchers working on uh, science and environmental health. Um, and ultimately networking and increases your professional visibility which can lead to job offers, funding, uh, et cetera. Another pro is uh, being able to share your research more widely. Um, disseminating your research online can make, make your science more accessible uh, to more and different audiences um, beyond scientists and, and academia in general. So while they're, oh, so actually, a, a recent paper discussed what I thought uh, some of the pros are very well, um, and I've linked to that paper here. Um, but it's a, it's a paper in pediatric, pediatric and perinatal endocrinology um, from last week, it published last week, uh, from epidemiologists Lisa Bodnar and, and Matthew Fox. And they say, until the last decade, scientists were often just a name on the byline of an article or textbook or someone you saw at a conference or invited lecture. Interaction or debate occurred at annual meetings or in letters to the editor. Now, engagement on Twitter is daily and it has made many of us more approachable, more relatable, and also better scientists. Uh, so I thought that sounded well and that's a paper I would encourage everybody to go check out. Um, okay, so while there are pros, there are also cons. Um, First and foremost, being on social media, as we all know, can eat up a lot of your time if you're not careful. Um, I, I find myself doing that in my personal capacity, so I try not to let that happen in my professional. Um, also being online, you know, there can be, there can be conflict. You, there can be hostile interactions. Uh, you may have to deal with trolls who comment on your post um, who try to provoke you. Uh, there are industry reps or contrarians who just may outright dismiss your science. Um, there's also controversy, which is really uh, other scientists or academics questioning your science. It may be um, research you publish that challenges the status quo, for example. Uh, it also could be when journalists ask tough questions about your science because um, they're not quite convinced about the strength of it, for example. However, uh, the cons need not outweigh the pros um, because the value of communicating your science online really is, in, is immense. Um, so next, I'll, I'll talk about some basic tactics to build your brand and protect your credibility so that you're prepared for these cons. Okay, so building your brand. Um, in order to build your brand, it's really essential that you have a social media plan or strategy in place before you get started. And here I've outlined six steps uh, to develop your brand strategy. Um, so not only are you more in control, uh, you can also manage your time, hopefully more, more efficiently and more effectively. So step one is creating goals. Uh, Step two is create a profile. Step three is um, follow colleagues, scientific societies, uh, the school where you work, or um, connect with 
um, conferences you attend. Step four is sit back and observe, which we call lurking online. Uh, step five is develop your posting strategy and start engaging with others online. And then finally, step six is it's likely that your goals will evolve. Uh, so you'll use what you've learned over time to revise your strategy and your overall brand, uh, your overall plan for your online brand. Okay, so step one. Um, step one is determining your goals for social media. And the goals you determine for social media are really what will help you determine how you want to present yourself on social media. They'll also help you determine which social media platform uh, can help you best achieve your goals. Um, so what are your goals? Uh, do you want to stay updated with the latest news and events in the field of environmental health or epidemiology? Are you trying to find a job? Um, are you hoping to collaborate with other researchers on a new paper? Um, are you looking for, maybe you're, mo you're more well established in the lab and now you're looking for funding? Um, and as an aside, uh, tweeting about a study can increase citations to that paper. Um, and there's a, there was a recent paper in the Journal of Medical Internet Research that says articles that many people tweeted about were 11 times more likely to be highly cited than those who few people tweeted about, um, which we're seeing more and more translates to funding. So maybe this is um, one of your major goals. So if the answer is yes to the goal stated here, it's most likely that Twitter is your best bet to get started. Um, it's where you learned about this webinar, so I'm hoping that that <laughs> is true. Um, so Twitter is a good place to dip your toes into social media professionally um, if you aren't online already, or maybe you've just thought about it. Uh, Twitter is also a great resource for epidemiologists like yourselves. Um, there's a, a lot of epidemi epidemiologists online um, at large. Um, so it's likely that you'll find a good network um, on Twitter for the work that you're already doing. Um, there's also a, a place that you can manage your time um, a little bit better, say, than blogging or podcasting, which um, requires quite a bit much more uh, time commitment. So overall, this is why we'll, we'll focus on Twitter today, because I really do find that it's professionally just sort of the most bang for your buck in terms of ROI. So step two, we're going to talk about uh, profiles online, how to create your profile. Um, and this is uh, an actual uh, profile, Twitter profile online for, for Dr. Fuller. Um, and I thought this was a good um, example of a good profile. So some pointers for creating or editing a profile if you are already online is um, you'll pick a handle, which is your name. And so, so here, Dr. Fuller is used, Dr. Fuller. You could also use um, the name of your lab as a Twitter handle, but keep in mind, um, your university may have policies regarding that. So before you pick your handle, know um, what you're allowed to do if you decide to do a lab um, Twitter handle versus one just personally, professionally for yourself. Um, let's see, you'll want to choose a photo. I thought uh, Dr. Fuller does a good job here of looking really engaging and really professional. Um, and then you'll also choose a header photo, which is this big photo um, on the top. Um, and this is a, I thought she did a good job here. This is the Atlanta skyline, which is um, where she works and where she lives. It's her community. Um, so it's an opportunity to showcase something maybe beyond your professional interests. Um, and it's it just a little humanizing, I think, which is always a good thing. Um, so then next you'll, you'll create a bio, um, which is short, um, really to the point. And it'll include your title. Um, Often it includes your interests or passions. So here she has air quality and environmental uh, justice. 
which she has hashtagged. Um, so these hashtags are keywords that, that link between all tweets and profiles using those uh, hashtags. So people will be able to find your profile if you, you um, by searching a hashtag, say air quality, and it's on your profile, then, then your profile would pop up for other people. Um, and before you use a hashtag in your own profile, I would always recommend uh, searching it before you use it, just to make sure it's being used how you think it's being used. Um, your profile is also a good place to link to your university profile page. Use, so here she's used the URL for um, Georgia State University. Um, so people can check out more about you uh, beyond Twitter. Um, your profile is also a good place to include groups or side projects that you're involved with. So for example, um, Joan, you may have uh, at ISCE um, North America in your, in your bio um, on your profile. Um, okay, so next. So once you set up your profile, the next step is to start following. Um, you want to start connecting with others by following people, people you know, um, maybe people you've heard of, um, you've seen them as co-authors on, on a colleague's paper, you don't know them, but uh, you can start following them online. Uh, you can follow groups, so ISEE is a, is a great example of that, um, or other professional societies that you're a member of. Um, you can also follow conference. Um, Twitter <coughs> accounts. So ISE again has one, um, but it could be groups like APHA or AAAS, other conferences that you attend, you should probably follow them. Uh, and then this is also the step where you want to search some hashtags. Um, and these, again, these, these hashtags are keywords that um, allow you to follow uh, conversations, and discussions online that use that hashtag. So one popular one uh, might be academic chatter, um, which is, we'll talk about a little bit later, but um, it's just a discussion to see what people are saying on, um, about issues facing uh, academics today. So once you start follow, oh, here's a good way um, to find people that you should be following. So if you go to ISEE, you go to their um, profile. If you click on who is following ISEE, it's likely you will find a lot of familiar faces. Um, and just start, start following everybody who is following ISEE. Um, oftentimes, again, they'll be your colleagues. Um, and then once you start following people, just note that they don't, Unlike Facebook, for example, they don't automatically follow you back, um, which is a good thing uh, because if someone follows you, you don't have, you don't have to follow them back. Um, so here are some examples of uh, sample hashtags that you may want to search just to see what people are saying online about about different um, topics. So Epi Twitter is a really good one to start with, especially for uh, epidemiologists. It's not um, specific to environmental epidemiology, um, but it covers all issues of, say, study design for epidemiological studies, um, and then also issues that arise as being an academic in epidemiology. Um, that, the same goes with academic chatter or PhD chat. Uh, SciComm is a good place to follow discussions about science communication. Um, and that sort of runs the gamut from professional science communicators to different tips and, and tricks on, on how to communicate more effectively um, with your science in, in a variety of mediums. Um, then there's also hashtags like women in STEM, which are more issue focused um, about how to be a woman um, in academia, in, in the scientific. Uh, arena. So that's a good way to, to follow some discussions to see what people are talking about online um, and sort of immerse yourself in, in the conversations that are happening on Twitter. 
Okay, so once you've followed, uh, followed some people and have uh, followed some conversations online, the next step is what we call lurking. And lurking is an online term for, for when you look but you don't engage. Um, but lurking is almost, to me, the most important step. Um, that's because you can see um, you can see what you like that other people are doing, and you can also see what you don't like that other people are doing on Twitter. Um, and you can use this as inspiration uh, for developing your own brand online. Um, so here are some suggestions of people I think uh, do Twitter well. Um, Ellie Murray is Epi Ellie. Uh, she's got quite a bit of, uh, of quite a many followers. Um, and then there are familiar faces to you, I'm sure, like Dr. Amizoda, Dr. Tracy Woodruff, um, again, Dr. Fuller. Um, I think they do Twitter well and, and, and they're really good sources of inspiration for developing your own brand and your own online strategies. Um, so after you observe for a while, that should eventually make um, sharing and creating your own posts much easier. So once you follow people that you think do it well, then that allows you to retweet things that they're saying um, or comment on, on discussions that they've started. <clears throat> um, okay, so once you've lurked around for a bit, um, now you can start engaging. And really this is what I like to think of, what should I post? Um, so Twitter has, 280 characters, um, and you'll want to use them wisely and accurately. So, um, yeah, in, in 2017 is when they switched from 140 characters to 280 characters, um, but not everybody uses the full character amount, so it's not a requirement, but the, the new 280 characters really allows you to share uh, more information, especially longer URLs, perhaps to news articles and to your own scientific studies that you've published on them. Um, okay, so I recommend coming up with a posting strategy before you start posting. And what I mean by posting strategy is really um, the kinds of posts that you want to make and then also the frequency of those kinds of posts. Um, so I recommend starting simple and starting slow. So maybe that's once a week. Um, you post once a week and you try a different post each week of, of the different kinds of posts that I'm going to talk about next. Um, so different types of posts. Self-promotional is, for example, um, you post a paper that you've published or an award that you've received. Um, and these different posts accomplish different things. Um, so, informational posts. Uh, that is, for example, an upcoming webinar um, or information about a job opening in your lab or at your university. Um, or it could be about an upcoming conference you plan to attend uh, and that you'd like others to maybe register for. Um, Commenting allows you um, to engage in a discussion or a thread that you've been following. Um, so once you've been following something for a while, you can chime in um, on that discussion and, and post your own comment within a discussion that's already happening. You don't have to create something from scratch. You, you jump into something that's already underway. Uh, congratulatory posts are ways to applaud others' efforts with regards to um, maybe a paper that they've published um, or an award that they've received. Or it's an opportunity for you to thank someone for something they've done for you in a professional capacity. Um, this is also an opportunity to tell that journalist who wrote an article on your, on your study uh, that they did a great job um, in their article or, or in their interview with you. Um, that you liked how, how they wrote um, that article on your own paper. 
And then personal, an example of that would be maybe a, a photo from your work in the lab or say a selfie at a conference that, that you're attending. So yeah, so these are, again, the different, these, there are a bunch of different kinds of posts and they accomplish different things. Um, but once you get familiar with the different kinds of posts that you can make, you can sort of start to uh, change up the variety of posts and the frequency of posts once you get more comfortable with them. Okay. So what are some, here are some examples, uh, some good examples of self-promotional tweets. Um, so one is, come check out uh, uh, this talk I'm giving. Um, another one is, come check out this webinar. Um, these are good examples of, of self-promotional. The next slide are examples of informational tweets. Um, this is, hey, this job, here's this job opening, check it out. Uh, or there's an open submission for papers in a special issue in a journal. So. Um, these are just purely informational, but, but you can see how very easily done. Okay, so the next step is after you have um, taken a few months to, um, to sit back and lurk and then, and then engage, start posting your own stuff. Um, after a few months, go back and look at your original social media goals. Um, what did you learn from lurking? What did you learn from posting? Um, how does this affect your, your original goals? And then um, how can you revise those original goals based on what you've learned um, to develop your brand? And, and your brand will develop periodically as you go back and revise and sort of adapt your strategies uh, to fit your new goals. Um, this is a very important step, I think. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we are going to talk about dealing with conflict and controversy. Um, so unfortunately, if your research is controversial in nature, that controversy can follow you online. Um, however, like with media interviews, uh, you can be prepared online. And being prepared online ultimately always protects you and your credibility. Um, so the best place to start here is with making a plan. Before you get started, so before you ever tweet about a new study that, that may make waves in the media um, or with other academics, make a plan. Plan out ahead of time your strategy for social media and check in say with your press office or your communications office at your institution. They may have support they can offer um, or suggested guidelines to follow uh, that can be really helpful. Uh, the cycle online, thankfully, is, is short. So if you're afraid you don't have the time or the nerves to deal with potential criticism or backlash on a paper that you have coming out, perhaps it's not it's better to not proactively tweet about it, for example. However, tweeting about um, a, a controversial study that you're a part of gives you some control over what, what your main messages are about those controversial findings. Um, I would also recommend thinking of in advance about the tough questions you may encounter. For example, uh, what are some common criticisms you hear about epidemiology studies or epi study design? Uh, often on Twitter, there's lots of debates uh, or discussions about correlation isn't caus causation. Um, so you'll see that a lot. So this is a good opportunity before you start to post to, to also ask colleagues for advice uh, and advice on potential posts that you want to make or maybe comments you want to make. Um, have people ready before you get started who, who can help you out uh, and, and review what you're planning on doing. Um, again, solicit help from others who are online who have already done controversial work. This is a good way to, um, to elicit thoughts and feedback from those who've sort of already been through the gauntlet, um, <laughs> as one might say. Um, again, 
when stuff is controversial, it's always best to be deliberate and not reactive. Um, sorry. Uh, it's always better to be deliberate and not reactive. Um, in that similar vein, it, it, it always be accurate. So don't guess, don't speculate or speak outside your expertise, which is, this is similar to what we say in our media training 101. Um, so again, watch yourself. Uh, if you're using words like cause when you don't mean causation, um, that should be a red flag for you to, to take a step back and, and, and be more deliberate with, with your word choice uh, in your tweet. Um, this is also an opportunity to have citations to science that um, other scientific studies that may back up your, your position or your findings. And my advice is the younger or earlier you are in your career, uh, the more careful and the more deliberate you should be. You just frankly have more to lose uh, than say somebody tenured and, um, and much farther along in their, in their career. And then um, finally, how do you know when when um, to respond to people who are commenting nasty things or maybe scary things or attacking your science. Um, you have to learn to know when to engage. And that really means A, learning to use the mute and the block features on Twitter. Um, so muting is you no longer get notifications um, if people are commenting at you uh, in a particular thread or conversation. Um, you can just quiet sort of the notifications that you get so you're not inundated and you can just kind of ignore them. Um, you can also block people, which is, so say you're getting attacked online, you, you choose to block someone, they can no longer see your posts um, and you can no longer see theirs, but you don't get any notifications about um, about them and you can't see really what they're up to, which is, which is nice if, um, if they are, you know, for example, a troll, <clears throat> which we'll get to now, which is, so how do you know when to respond? And really that is, you, ask, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Um, the first step is to check out that person's profile to see if, they're real. Are they, are, are they a bot? Are they a known contrarian? Um, so if you go to their profile, you can see what, what their tweet history is and what their comment history is. Um, so a troll is just a person who comments on a lot of people's posts. They're akin to a schoolyard bully. They just want to provoke and get a response. Um, a bot really is an automated thing. It's not a real person. Um, but Oftentimes, people use bots to stir up controversy. So if you visit their profile, you'll see that they don't have any followers. There's little information about them. Those are people to ignore um, right off the bat. Trolls and, trolls and bots aren't worth your time. Uh, contrarians, you'll find a lot on Twitter as well. Um, and these are real people, but these are um, like journalist contrarians. They, they uh, or scientific contrarians, you'll, they, they stand against most issues that are mainstream. Um, those are also generally not worth engaging um, on Twitter. But say you get a comment um, or a post, somebody posts about your study, um, and it's someone that you, you respect or that you know is legitimate scientifically, um, sometimes it's worth taking the conversation offline. Uh, you can email them directly if it's a conversation that you think is worth, worth having. Uh, maybe they got something about your science wrong. Um, take it offline. And um, <clears throat> because with only 280 characters on, on Twitter, it's really hard to understand tone um, or to get, a full, to get a full thought or point across. So sometimes taking it offline will result in a more valuable discussion offline versus having one on Twitter where uh, you just sort of go back and forth but never really quite get anywhere. Um, and then with all of this, with controversy and with, with conflict, it's, it's always good to learn to grow a bit of a thick skin. Um, 
luckily things online move swiftly and the next day it's on to the next topic. So while um, it can be stressful in the moment, take a step back and, uh, and life moves on. You, you don't always have to engage or get bogged down with, uh, with petty arguments that are happening on Twitter, essentially. Um, okay, so to, in the interest of time, yeah. Uh, to recap, we've covered quite a bit of information quickly. Um, we've talked about how to expand your, your network and reach. So using Twitter um, as a tool to expand your network of colleagues, uh, follow journalists um, who might be covering your research. You can also find community groups online that may be affected by, by your research. Uh, you can follow and see what they have to say on, on particular topics. <clears throat> um, always plan ahead where possible. So be deliberate and not reactive. Um, and the more you plan ahead, the less likely you are to post or comment something that you wouldn't otherwise. So I highly recommend this. Um, for example, don't ever post a news article without reading the whole thing. Um, don't just like people's posts to appease people. Um, what you like and what you post represent your values online. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, also, what goes online stays online. Um, Twitter can be a professional forum for you. So don't get too comfortable behind your phone or your computer. Um, what you put on Twitter is still an outward representation of you as a professional scientist. Um, and it should represent your values, your ethics, and your commitment to your science. And then at the end of the day, just simply turn it off. Don't let being online, being on, a, on social media, be a time suck. Take a break, turn it off, and then it'll always be there when you want to come back. Okay. Um, next, some, there's a wealth of information online to help you continue to learn about using social media as a scientist. Um, and there's lots of resources to help you improve your science communication skills. Uh, I've compiled a short list here, um, and I'm happy to share this uh, slide deck with Joan for those who want to see it. These are hyperlinked so you can uh, access these resources that I've listed here. Um, but AAAS has a good communications toolkit for scientists, um, and they have a whole section devoted to social media, which is really, really helpful. Uh, Nature Jobs blog also has a lot of entries on scientists using social media. Um, for networking and for scientific dissemination. So that's, uh, I would encourage you to check that out. It's worthwhile. Um, and then of course, going back to following uh, Epi Twitter and I am SciComm, um, these are a lot of resources on Twitter itself to help you get started. Um, and then there's also, uh, increasingly you'll see with uh, papers as you publish, journals are using um, this service called Altmetric, which tracks online mentions of, of scientific papers that have published. Um, and increasingly, Altmetrics are used um, for applications for funding and, and for job searching. So that they have a lot of research, resources online about how to best use social media platforms to increase your, your citations. Um, and that is it. Are there any questions? Thank you, Emily. That was great. Uh, so if folks on here have any questions, go ahead and hit that chat button at the bottom of the screen and you can type any questions you might have in there uh, while people are thinking about that. I have a question. Could you talk a little bit more about engaging with journalists? So you talk about following journalists that might be interested in your work, but when and how is appropriate to contact these journalists via social media? Um, that's a great question. So. Twitter primarily started as a, <laughs> as a hangout for journalists. So you'll see a lot, most journalists on there. Um, so as a scientist, a good way to get started is to follow journalists who cover maybe health, science, uh, environmental health, to see what they're posting about. So you can use Twitter um, to see what, what interests a journalist. So maybe prior to an interview, um, 
say you have a paper coming out uh, and they, they and you set up an interview with a journalist, that's a good opportunity to check out their Twitter to see what kinds of things they cover and what they're interested in to give you some background on them as a person before you go into an interview. Um, on Twitter itself, it's an easy way to engage journalists uh, on a topic maybe that they that you want to flag for them. So if you know um, X person at the New York Times writes about every study that you publish, um, say you have a study that publishes online and you didn't do media outreach beforehand, you know, you didn't have a press release, you didn't have time, it just went online. Uh, you could post a UR, you could post on Twitter, I have this new paper coming out, and then you can tag different journalists that you think might be interested in this study. Hmm. Um, that would be an appropriate use of it. Um, uh, also, it's an appropriate way to get journalists involved maybe in a discussion that, um, a scientific discussion uh, that you think that they would be interested in following. So maybe that might be more for an investigative journalist. Mm -hmm. um, so a good example of that is um, we see a lot of conversations about the latest PFAS science uh, on Twitter. And Sharon Lerner at The Intercept follows PFAS religiously. So if you think it's something that she might be interested in, you can at her. Um, so that she's aware of it and she'll get a notification. Um, I've also had uh, seen instances too where um, journalists may message you directly on, on Twitter about an interview on a study or a, if they see a discussion that you're having online. Um, they may contact you more proactively. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. So I was actually going to ask about direct messaging versus using the platform such that everyone can see a tweet you're sending. So okay. when, yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about the purpose of direct messaging when people might use that as opposed to just tweeting publicly. Um, I mean, I think it, it really just depends. Um, I, I think direct messages may be something, you see a journalist has posted a question about, uh, oftentimes you'll, you'll see a journalist go, I'm looking for an expert on X, say, um, and then you could just direct message them um, versus, you know, putting, a, responding to a comment in their thread and putting your email out there for the world to, <laughs> to see. Yeah. So you could just direct message them and say, oh, I'm an expert in X you know, shoot me an email if you want to talk about this further. That's an appropriate use of, of a direct message. Um, and, and, but do keep in mind, you know, direct messages, depending on the profile, the, like how high profile that journalist is, how many followers they have, um, it may get lost. Yeah. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then also always act as though everything you put out there is, could be seen by anyone. Um, so don't say, you know, that's not a, a direct message is not a forum to say things that you wouldn't otherwise say publicly. Um, I mean, I think it's for more uh, logistical or sensitive information in terms of maybe your, your phone number, or your email, or how best to get in contact with you or, um, but it's not, a, it's not a, a, an opportunity to um, say something that you wouldn't want on the record. I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, it's Twitter is luckily, I mean, th there's two major benefits, I think, for scientists is because the scientific community itself is super strong. And then you also have a journalist community that's very, very strong. Uh, and you have journalists on Twitter actively looking for new things to write about. Um, so they may find you, but that's a good way to um, use hashtags, like I mentioned. Uh, and then again, remember to search them first before you use them so you know that you're using the right ones. Um, but yeah, so good, yeah, so a good example of that is, uh, for those of you who are on Twitter, and Joan, I know you are, is uh, the hashtag forever chemicals that was created to mean PFAS, basically. Um, people search, journalists can search that and will cut straight through to scientists, but mostly scientists use that as well as advocacy groups um, versus 
scrolling through all of, uh, say, a search for hashtag PFAS. Um, it's a much more targeted search for people writing on, on PFAS if they're using forever chemicals, for example. Uh, so a journalist may be able to find you, um, find you based on the hashtags you're, you're using. Yeah, I think that you make a really strong argument for using hashtags because I actually don't see that many scientists using hashtags mm -hmm. because, I don't know, I previously didn't really understand the purpose of them, but it's nice to know that journalists and others that might be really interested in our area of research are actively searching on those hashtags. And it, it can really make your research much more available to a much broader group of people. Right. Um, especially for say a non a non journalist or a non scientist um, who wants to learn more about hashtag endocrine disruptors um, but the more i think that where people get confused or hesitant with hashtags is the more broad or generic the hashtag is right the more information that pops up when you search it so the more targeted and specific you can be in your hashtag use um, you know you sort of stand out from all this this wealth of information so you wouldn't use you know maybe public health <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> use that um, but if you can use a specific thing that you're like maybe a chemical that you're researching um, air pollution or something yes yeah is, is, is a little bit easier um, and then again epi twitter is huge um, it, it, that really narrows the community because the only people really using epi twitter are epidemiologists um, so that that makes it a little bit more helpful great so i'm not seeing anyone has no one's typed in a question here does anyone on here have a question don't be scared emily did give us a really great overview but um while we have her here if anyone has questions that would be great um, yeah, and then I, I can also uh, put into the chat my email address, which if, if anybody has follow-up questions or if they get in contact with you, uh, Joan, mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to answer questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, okay, that's super cool. I find that I find that most people have more specific questions than they have general questions. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, that's definitely the trend, especially with, with social media. So I'm definitely here to answer questions you have especially the more uh, tricky or specific they are might be easier to do over email fantastic well emily thank you so much for your time this was really helpful and i know that people watching this on replay will also get a lot out of it Great. so uh everyone hopefully will also start following you on twitter <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's um, your handle um i'm at emily scn um and then really, I, I think it's the, I stress this in my, uh, in my presentation, but everybody should check out the ISEE North American chapter. Twitter is such a great place to start to find people who you already know are your colleagues. Um, and I think that that's a really important first step for those of you who are sort of wading into the waters. Perfect. All right, Emily, thank you very much. Everybody great. have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.